I'm Bill Ennis, and I'm going to be talking to you today about coaching adult basketball. And I'll be drawing a comparison for you. You know, when I was a kid, or even when you're working with uh, kids like boys or girls, it doesn't really matter. It's both the same thing. Uh, be it a school for the deaf or Gallaudet University or whatever university you have. I'm here to let you know that coaches really have an easy life because you always have kids who are lining up in droves who are enthusiastic and wanting to try out so the coach just has to set up specific times and dates uh, here at the university as I recall in my time it was uh, usually October 15th and they would set up tryouts for a week and that gave the coach an opportunity to look over what kind of material he had and he had a nice pool of players from which to select and usually the criteria would include things like height speed uh, skills, basic fundamental skills such as dribbling, ability to play on defense and so forth. You'd have that all right there for you and then you were able to go through and begin the team selection process. Then once tryouts were done you put up the roster. That was always uh, an interesting time to say the least and if someone saw that their name was on it then they knew that they had made the team. If however they didn't see their name that meant that they had been cut and usually caused some heartache. One of the other things about the arena of uh, school sports, basketball, is that the uniform, shoes, socks, and uh, I don't know what girls use, but I know that uh, jock straps for guys were all provided by the university or by the school so that they would have everything ready for when practice started. And of course, the gym was never a problem because it was already there. All you had to do was set up what times you were going to begin practice. And you know in basketball there's no such thing as a labor law. You have to work uh, seven afternoons a week and a coach can order them to do that as much as they want. Uh, you just have to basically set up the times that you need the gym to do that. Uh, even meals were taken care of by the uh, school settings. Uh, usually it was very good food for the basketball players. In fact they were given preference over students who weren't players. So there are all these kinds of things associated with basketball in a school setting. Now let me switch gears for a minute and talk about adult coaching. And when I say adults, I'm referring to individuals who have completed their school or finished whatever post-secondary programs they've been in. And when they're done, they're ready to play some ball still. They have available to them some deaf clubs such as the American Athletic Association for the Deaf or the Southeastern Athletic Association for the Deaf. Sometimes in their own hometowns, they'll have recreation centers that set up teams that they can join or sometimes church leagues, uh, which is actually perfect for me, the over 40 crowd, so that we can still play. So those are some of the options available to individuals as adults. Uh, you may want to know that there's certainly some difference from schools. For example, uh, adults don't have uniforms because of money, so they have to pay for that on their own. Uh, I know that in universities and colleges, the uniforms and shoes have to be the same. Uh, especially in my time in the 1960s, we also were required to have shoes and uniforms that were all identical. We weren't permitted to be different. Now with adults, everyone follows their own taste. Some have $150 shoes, some have designer shoes, some have some plain ones, and you have a whole host of different shoes to deal with. They're only there to play basketball, so they have to take care of their uniform on their own. Now the gym does create a little bit of a problem because it's difficult sometimes to even get a place to practice. It's difficult alone just trying to get adults to come and try out. Coaches have to practically get on their hands and knees and beg people to come. And When you do, you get a whole host of excuses about how I've got my wife or my kid to get to. You never have saw those kinds of problems in Gallaudet or in the high school level. You always had tons of people to choose from and uh, it's a much more difficult process to pull together an adult team. And then when you look at what your selection is, you've got people who are old and graying, some fat, some that are real young, people that are basically out of shape. You're also dealing with a huge range of ages and skills. But if uh, you want to have a basketball team, you've got to work with what you've got. Uh, let me come back to this point on the gym. Uh, normally what leagues can do sometimes is they'll collect money and then pay out to a place so they can have Saturday games. 
And now one of the excuses I've heard sometimes is that people say, well, we need some practice. And I always tell them, don't worry about it. Just show up to the game and we'll start talking about what to do there. Uh, I can start teaching and showing you what you need to do and actually do the coaching there. Now, of course, one of the nice things is that usually I'm getting people who've had some experience. And if necessary, someone's on the floor doing something, I can always ask them to come off the floor. And, of course, I always get a lot of flack about how they didn't have much time to play. But I have to sit down and explain to them the, what's going on on the floor and, and what they need to change. So you can actually do the coaching there at the game itself. You may be curious as to how it is I set up a defense. Uh, I think a good basis is usually to start with a 2-1-2 zone defense. And I'll tell you how I uh, decide to put who where in that 2-1-2 zone defense. And it's pretty much the accepted standard. Uh, in the back court, you set up two guards. Uh, in the lower or front court, you have two forwards. And then in center court, you'll put uh, your center. Now, what my experience has taught me that it's better that to have uh, the guards uh, up front who are fast. And for the forwards, uh, sometimes you'll have a really good player that you really want to use, but they're a little bit slow. So it's usually a safe uh, place to put them if you put them in the position of the forwards in the lower court, uh, mostly because they don't have to negotiate a lot of space. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, if the ball hits them, uh, they're very slow to react, and what you need are people up front who can go fast. Uh, for your center, you want someone who's hopefully 6'6", or 2", or whatever. Uh, actually, height is not the critical skill for the individual. You want a, someone who's really quick. The reason being that uh, if the ball goes outside the boundary set by the guards and the forward, then you need them to be able to uh, have a real nose for the ball and be able to get it when it goes outside those bounds. So that's one of the defenses we have. Uh, it's hard to find big guys these days uh, among the adult basketball teams. You don't have the big boys, uh, not nearly as many as you have in college, of course. You know, those who can run really fast and are very good at uh, getting one-on-one -on -one to people. Uh, sometimes you're very fortunate if you can find a young guard to play, but usually it's safe to keep it at, at this zone defense I've been describing to you. Uh, now, every now and again, when you set up your 2-1-2, you may find that you have some really strong guards. Uh, and uh, it may be better to set up a 1-3-1, one, one, where you have one uh, person up front in the back court, one in the lower court, and then three in center. My personal favorite is the 1-2-2. Two, two. Now, in the 1-2-2, two, two, you want someone who is 6-2 or taller, and then you'll set up two players at the uh, center and lower court. And you want people in the center who are real intelligent, intelligent about how to play basketball. Uh, and are also very quick. Then you have your person up front who blocks the ball. Uh, that's why you want him to be so tall. And hopefully you'll force the offense's nose guard to shoot the ball off from the center where you have your uh, two individuals set up at center court and lower court, and hopefully they'll be able to ca cut off the passing lane. If uh, nothing else, at least slow the offense down. And to be quite frank with you, the real key to adult games is defense. If you've got a lousy defense, you're not going to win. And I like to win. I don't care how I win. I like to win. I want to be the guy who, at the end of the game, even though I don't smoke, I like to be the guy who gets to walk out on the court with his victory cigar. So I like to win. Uh, so the key really is to be able to know how to work with your defense and change it, modify it as you need. Now. Setting up a good offense is nearly impossible without a lot of practice and people who know their positions. So basically what we look for is someone who is uh, good at handling the ball because what happens is the defense will quickly pick up on who's good with that and be on them. So you want someone who can really handle the ball well and someone who can carry the ball, of course, as well. And basically there's a, the best setup for that would be a 3-2 offense where you'd have a center person with two wings on either side and then they can feed uh, to the center person who can then make a basket or have someone who can feed from the front. Uh, you basically just want to have something pretty simple set up there. I really don't spend a lot of time on offense uh, because a great deal of setting up offense depends on what kind of material you have. Uh, if you don't have things, then sometimes you can't do what you want. Like if you don't have someone who can shoot a three-pointer, and that's a whole different subject. I guess I come from an old school. 
because uh, when you look at Johns Hopkins or Georgetown University, they play real close to the basket and keep things fed up. And today, they uh, seem to emphasize more playing more outside of the inner court. And it has been my experience, though, in the last few years of coaching, that those three-point baskets can really upset a game. You can perhaps be up by three or four points with, say, one or two minutes to go in the game, and all it takes is for someone to pop two of those into the basket, and the next thing you know, you're behind by two. So if you find someone who can do a three-point basket, that's great, but it's never been a particular emphasis of mine. Basically what I like are people who can feed to each other and stay inside the inner court. They need to be able to play real tight. I like a defense that can play tight and feed to each other well. Basically what you'll want is to have someone out by the sideline because if the ball gets trapped inside, then what you can do is shoot it to this person who's waiting outside and normally they'll have nearly all day to shoot a basket. So I have to admit, though, that coaching is always fun, regardless of the limited time and selection and quality of players. It certainly is always a lot of fun. And that shows that we adults uh, can keep going, uh, doing this, until you get about 45. And then after that, I recommend you switch over to playing golf uh, because you don't have the endurance you once had. I've had so many people tell me that they can go for 10 minutes, but uh, with golf, they can do that all night. So I thank you for your patience and your attention. And let me encourage you that if you want to go and play basketball, I hope that you'll take any opportunities that become available to you. My name is Sandra McLellan. I'm going to talk about my job experiences. I graduated from Gallaudet in 1979 with a degree in PE. And I sent my resume all over the place. But there were no jobs for PE teachers anywhere. Well, in spite of that, I decided to continue sending my resume out, and finally I got a job at the Florida School for the Deaf. Well, a job was with all these adorable little kids from 6 to 11 year old. Well, this was my first job, and I was going to be supervising the kids, and I had to work on the weekends, and I really hated it, but I decided to put up with it because it was my first job. There were several different kind of activities. We took them swinging and to get ice cream and to different beaches in Florida. I worked there for about a year, but again, because I hated working on weekends, I decided to change jobs. And I moved to the New Jersey School for the Deaf in Trenton. Once again, I was supervising kids and working as a dorm counselor. I was working in a middle school this time, and so I was working with the track team and the basketball team, and, and, all, and I was also the volleyball coach. While I was at the Florida School for the Deaf, the kids used my name sign that I'd had all my life. When I moved to the New Jersey school, however, this, this S sign, name sign that I had also was the same sign that belonged to my boss, and her name was Betty and her last name was Schwartz. So anyway, I couldn't obviously have the same name sign as my boss and the kids started asking me what my first name was. When I told them Ruth, they gave me an R name sign right here on the elbow. I really hated this name sign, but I decided to take it. At any rate, when I ran into my best friend from CSUN and she saw my name sign, she said, you grew up with this other name sign your entire life and now you're gonna change it? At any rate, we struggled at that school um, because of racism and a lot of problems that were going on there, and there were a lot of issues that I didn't agree with. And I worked there for about two years, but I finally decided to leave. And then I moved to New York State and started working in the Fanwood School for the Deaf. I liked working there, and when I went there, the kids started calling me Sandy again. But when they saw my name sign, they thought that it meant that I used drugs, that I was a pothead or something. And I told them no, that it was, it was a name sign that I had been given a long time ago and I'd used it all my life. They said, you're lying, I don't believe you. Anyway, my boss felt that the name sign wasn't appropriate, so she called a meeting of the entire staff and we were all sitting in the room. And we went around the room and tried to decide a new name sign for me because they said that this name sign wasn't appropriate because it looked too much like drugs. 
Well, the first name sign they wanted to give me was an S off of my nose because I'm really funny. But I didn't like that one because it was silly. And also, I didn't feel comfortable with it. So then they gave me another name sign, an S on the side of my face because I kind of smile a lot. Well, then when I went back, to, I, le I decided to leave the school at Fanwood and went to the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. And I worked there for about five years. That was a good experience for me. I worked as an elementary school PE teacher, but after a while the elementary school closed down and we merged with the school that went up to eighth grade. And at that school they used the same name sign, the S on the side of my face, and I kind of liked that, so I took it. When I came back here to Gallaudet, I did adopt my old name sign back, the S on my elbow again, because I felt more comfortable and felt it was okay for adults to use that. So now when I run into kids around Gallaudet that knew me from all the different schools, I can tell where they met me because they all know me by these different name signs. I worked at four different schools, the one in Florida, the one in New Jersey, the Fanwood School, and also at the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Well, now I'm here at Gallaudet, and I'm a PE teacher for the prep school. The prep school is for kids who are still kind of nervous and not really comfortable with, with college life. They're really kind of braggarts and show off, and they walk around with hickeys and things on their neck. And so I have to kind of help them through the health classes and let them know that those kind of things aren't really appropriate. It's also a good job for me because I get to see the kids grow up, and I like that. It's been great for me working at the four different deaf schools, but my most enjoyable experience has been working with the college kids because of the interaction that I have. Often um, with the younger kids, I had to feed them and baby them and just kind of take care of them too much. Now with the college students, if I tell them something, if they don't like it, I can just give them an F if they argue with me and don't do the appropriate thing. So I don't have to worry about it. That's about all about my experiences. My name is Lee Ivey, and I'm from North Carolina. I'm going to be talking about potpourri. The dictionary defines potpourri as being from the French, and it's a mixture of dried flowers with perfume or spices. Today we still use the term potpourri to mean dried flowers mixed with spices and perfume. And now I'm going to talk about how this has become one of my favorite hobbies. And I've been involved in this for about three years. Best time to collect flowers is in the spring and summer when you can go outside and gather the flowers that you really like. You tie them into a bunch and then you find a room which is both hot and dry but also has air circulation. You don't want to put them in an airtight room. You might want to go to the attic where there isn't too much light. The sunlight would fade the flowers and you don't want to do that. You want to keep the flowers in their natural color. You also need to find some string and measure an appropriate length. Use your common sense. You need to strip the leaves off of the stems and tie them in a bunch. If you don't feel like stripping the stems, that's okay too. After you've got them tied in bunches, you hang them upside down and you leave them there for six weeks. And this, this is about the amount of time it takes for them to dry. You can go and check and see if you're satisfied with how they look. And then there are several ways that you can use the dried flowers. First of all, you take the heads of the flowers off and throw away the stems. You put the heads of the flowers in an appropriate size bowl. and you pick the fragrances and spices that you like. You might choose nutmeg, basil, mint, cinnamon. All of these are dried spices or herbs. You pick the ones that you like and the, the scents that you enjoy and you mix them with the flowers and then you find some oil, perhaps rose or lavender or lilac. 
you can go to a store and you can find these in ready to purchase small bottles. Then you put the mixture in an airtight container and leave it for six weeks. And when you open it, you'll find that it's wonderfully fragrant and it smells really nice. Now, as for how to get the oil, you could make it at home. It really is very time consuming and it the oil increases itself in very, very small amounts. First of all, you take some alcohol and some salt. I don't mean table salt. And then you need some petals from the flowers. And you mix those three things together. And every day, you have to check on it. Each 24 hours, you have to take out the old petals and put in fresh petals. And the oil increases very, very slowly. It could take four weeks. I did it. I did it one time, and I found it too frustrating. I gave up because I have two children, and they keep me busy. I prefer to buy the oil ready-made and in small bottles. And you can still enjoy mixing your potpourri using those. You take the, a bunch of flowers, and there are various things that you can do. You make potpourri. You can also make arrangements in baskets. You could make wreaths. I like to make these wreaths. You can put them on walls or doors. And then another thing that you can do with the mixture is that you can make sachet. Sachet is, um, you might pick something that's uh, a pretty color of cloth and make a small square so that it's a pocket, turn it inside out, and stuff it with the petals and sew the top shut. You can decorate it with lace and then ribbon. And then when it's ready, you can put it in your drawers or you could hang it in your closet, or you could even hang it in your car so that your car smells nice and you won't be embarrassed when your friends come in there because there will be no bad odors. I really enjoy this myself. It's an easy hobby, and I hope that you will enjoy doing it. Hi, my name is Lena Darren. What am I going to talk to you about today? A job experience I had how I got the job, where it was, and so forth. I went into the library and pulled up my VAX account. And on my email, I noticed a note that said, congratulations, you got the job. I was shocked. Imagine, I had no job interview. I couldn't figure it out. Well, anyway, the job was at USDA. And I was supposed to start on January 13th at 8.30 in the morning as a GS4. I was pretty excited, because that's kind of good money for a college student. So anyway, I figured out what I was going to wear and got my little outfit together and got all ready to go to the job interview, the job appointment. And uh, as I got there, I looked around in the neighborhood and wasn't quite sure where the building was. So I found someone and I asked her. And as she started talking to me, I realized I didn't know what she was saying. So I told her that I was deaf. And she kind of gestured and told me where the building was. So once I got into the lobby, I looked around and it was a pretty nice building and I noticed I was supposed to be on the third floor. Well when I got off the elevator at the third floor there were no name plates, no room numbers, nothing and I couldn't figure out exactly where I was supposed to go. So right in front of me there was a door. I went in and I went around one of those partitions that are in offices and there was a woman sitting there typing. So when she stopped, I asked her this person that, for this person, Diane, that I was looking for. I wrote her a note, and she went and got the person. So I was sitting there and waiting, and she came back and started talking to me, and I told her I was deaf. And she introduced herself to me. And I said, hmm, there's no interpreter here. She fingerspelled, but I didn't really... I noticed that there was no interpreter. Anyway, I told her my name was Lena Darren. And she suggested that I follow her, and the two of us walked down the hall and went to a meeting room. It was a big table and lots of people in the room, and again, I looked and realized there was no interpreter, and I kind of checked out all the people there and met all of them, and we smiled and said hi and so forth. And someone came in to give a presentation, and I said, excuse me, and tried to ask someone about the interpreter, but they said, wait a minute, we'll talk to you later. So, again, I sat there and just figured, well, I'll just have to deal with it. So I looked at the woman. I was checking her out, looking at her hair and looking at her eyeglasses and so forth. And I looked around the room and saw somebody leaning on their elbow. And I looked and checked out somebody else's shoes and thought they were pretty interesting. And I just kind of, my eyes wandered around the room until the meeting was over. And then we all left. 
Well, after that was over with, they gave me some forms to fill out to do my paperwork for the new job. We did that, and we went down two flights of steps to the first floor. They took me in an office where I met my supervisor. Supervisor had a very firm handshake, and I was kind of nervous because it was kind of tight, but I smiled and, you know, tried to pretend and act appropriately. So we smiled and looked at each other and just acted like we were supposed to. Anyway, I, I was introduced to all the people in the office, and the supervisor suggested that I come with her because she wanted to show me where my office was. So she told me I could sit down, and she left. Well, I sat, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and I became very antsy. So I decided to check and see what was in the drawers. Well, there was nothing in the first drawer I looked in, so I continued to open drawers, four, five, six of them. And as I was going through a cabinet, my supervisor came back in and caught me, and I felt a little embarrassed. But anyway, she gave me this piece of paper to read, and uh, it was rules about the office that I wasn't supposed to smoke, where the bathroom was, how long breaks were, all that kind of thing. There were lots and lots of rules on this paper. So I finished reading them. My supervisor came back and asked if I had any questions about it. And I told her no, but I did want to know if, I, if there was any work for me to do. And when she said that there wasn't, I just decided, okay, I'll put up with it. So anyway, after a while, she came back in and asked me if I knew anything about computers, if I knew how to run Lotus 1, 2, 3 on a computer, and I told her no. Well, I did inform her that I had experience working with WordPerfect, and she said, well, if you have experience at that, go ahead and use it. So I started typing and kind of playing around on a computer and reading what was in there, and after a while, I started getting sleepy, and I, I caught myself and decided I better get up and go to the bathroom. So I went in the bathroom and closed the door on the stall and settled in for a nice nap. Well, while I was sleeping, somebody came into the stall next door to me and kind of shook the walls and woke me up, and I decided I better make some noise so people wouldn't realize I was sleeping. So I started crumpling some paper, and I watched a woman's feet walk past the stall I was in and go into the one next door to me, and I'm still crumpling the paper trying to make noise and wiggling around and so forth. Well, the woman came out of the bathroom and washed her hands and kind of played in her hair a little bit, and then she left. So I wasn't really rested and decided to go back to sleep for 5 or 10 or maybe even 15 more minutes. And then I, I caught myself and said I better go back to my office. Well, again, when I set, got back to my office, there was nothing for me to do, and I started nodding again. And I tried to stay awake by noticing all the people who were walking up and down the hall. Well, one woman came by and introduced herself to me, and she told me her name was Sandy, and we kind of smiled at each other, and and I, I met lots of people that way. I told her, I, another person came by, and I told her my name was Laura, I told her my name was uh, Lena Darren, and uh, she asked me if I had a TTY, if I needed one, and I said, sure, that would be great. And I asked her if she had any work for me, and of course she told me no. But then after a minute she thought and said she did have something for me to do, and she brought me some papers to staple. And I wasn't excited about it, but I decided to do it anyway. And it was quite monotonous, and I kept going with it, and after a while it got very boring. So finally I finished it and took it back to her. And she said, you know, you're too fast. I can't believe you finished all of that work already. And I looked at her and thought to myself, oh, please. Anyway, again, she didn't have any more work for me to do, so I went back to my office and stared off into space some more. So a couple of hours passed, and my supervisor came in and uh, asked me if I had anything to do. And when I told her I didn't, she said that there was someone who would be coming tomorrow who I should work with. So I got really excited and decided to go on home for the day. Well, when I came in the next day, the woman hadn't arrived yet, but they told me that she would be in around 8.15 or 8.30. So I went back to my office, and I waited for her. And she, when she came in, she gave me some information to feed into the computer. After I had done that, I went back to her and asked her if there was any more for me to do, and she said, no, I don't have anything else for you. She said, why don't you go take a break for a while? A break? I don't really need a break. But the good news was that I got my TTY. 
Well, guess what I did when I got that? I called everybody I knew. I called my friends, and we talked for the longest time. I called a hairdresser, made an appointment, called a doctor. I was just making up all kinds of people to call. Well, even that got boring after a while, so I was sitting in my chair swinging my legs around and just trying to pass the time. And somebody came in with some supplies from my office. They brought me a name plate with my name on it and some scissors and stapler and, and, and all kinds of things from my office. It was really great, and I was, I was happy they brought that stuff for me. Well, I went back to sitting because there was still nothing to do. Finally, my boss came in and asked me if I wanted to leave for the day. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So she said, fine, go on home. When I got outside, I just decided to shake that place off of me and never go back. And that's the end of my story. Hello, I'm Anne-Marie Baer, and I'm from Maryland. And I'd like to talk about deaf artists. I'll begin the discussion by talking about deaf artists in general and then focusing on one particular artist who drew this picture. My earliest memory of seeing art that expressed the deaf experience was when I was small. I went to a deaf heritage festival and at the festival there were various activities of that concern deaf culture. I went into one room and saw oil paintings on the wall. One of these paintings fascinated me. It was a violin that had been cut in half and placed on the picture. There was a blue sky and clouds on the picture as well. And I wondered what this violin was saying to me, what this picture meant. And then I noticed that there were no strings on the violin, no strings at all. This picture was by a deaf artist, a person who couldn't hear music, but was expressing that experience of not hearing music. And it really hit me. As I grew up, I saw works by other deaf artists, works that express the experience of being deaf. There was one artist in particular, a woman named Betty Miller, and she used pastels and collages and oils, charcoal on her paintings, on her works of art. And her works showed people uh, that looked like puppets with jaws that moved and hands that were shackled, and that showed her experience of uh, the oral approach to communication and not being able to sign. Later, I saw uh, the work of a deaf man from Israel. And his work was like none I'd seen before. He showed people dancing, running, riding bikes, doing a variety of activities. And on the pictures were colored waves. And I was puzzled about these waves of color. When I looked closer, I saw that there was actually what looked to be a music lines or a musical page. And on those lines were the notes that you would use to follow to play music. This deaf artist used those notes and translated them into colored waves, expressing that music can be visual and expressed in colors. The colors had various meanings. For example, red, yellow, and orange were very high intensity colors, bright colors. And then there were more some, some more soothing colors, greens, cool blues, and black, the color of death in his work. Later, I bumped into this artist again, and he had continued to work. I'm going to show you one of his basic 
pieces. You can see here the color waves. He's drawn a dancer, and he was f fascinated with dance, even though he was deaf. When he was young, he grew up in Israel, and deaf people were encouraged to be involved with the arts. And he was put into a dance company called KOL Kol Silence. No, Kol meaning sound, and Demama meaning silence meaning it was a hearing and deaf dance troupe. And my husband was the first person put in that dance troupe, first deaf person. In the dance troupe, they did not use music. They used drums and percussion. And that percussion produced vibrations that they used to dance. And he felt a connection with the music and the movement. But still, there was something missing from that experience. He felt that color might make that music visual. And so he began to paint and to draw. And here you see the product of his artwork, his expression as a deaf dancer using color. I'm going to show you another one of his work. He did some about dancing and did some paintings about other life experiences. I'll give you a moment to take a look at it. In this painting on the top portion, there are yellow and green strokes and various colors. Below that are the written notes. And those written notes, the musical notes, have fallen off of the musical page. And the notes are, are down at the, the bottom of the page, expressing, expressing not hearing those notes. And waves of color have replaced those notes. On the bottom of the picture, there's a man standing playing some sort of instrument, but there's no instrument there. There's no trumpet. There's no flute. And then beside him, there's a dog, and the dog is looking off into the distance, not looking at the man, but looking off at something it can hear. And this is his expression of being deaf and not hearing music. I'd like to show you one more, the last one, and it's my favorite of his works. I'd like to explain more about this work. First, you see a music stand with the music book open. And on the page, there are no notes. It's blank. All of the musical notes have fallen off to the floor. And then below, you see a picture with a bright blue sky and a human form below it, a body that looks like death, that can't hear, that's silent. 
And then beside that, you see another body, another form that's lighter, brighter, and, and its head moves up into the sky. That lighter form is almost a spiritual expression of silence, the silence you experience being deaf and not hearing. I think that this is one of his stronger works. His other paintings deal with life experiences, things that happen. He's focused on the use of color in his work and continues to use that now. This artist has sold many works in Europe, in Belgium, and in Germany. He came here five years ago and exhibited his works and sold all of the works from that show. And I encourage him to keep it up, to keep on painting, and I hope that he will. He does focus on other things in life now. The reason I encourage him so much is because he happens to be my husband. His name is Uzi Buzgalo. And that's my presentation. Presentation is. Thank you. Hello. My name is Ina Williams. I'm from Jamaica. I'm a junior at Gallaudet University. And I'd like to talk about Jamaican food, in particular, a dish called curried goat. I know you've probably never seen that before. Now, if you go to Safeway or Giant or other food stores, they won't carry goat. It looks a lot like stewed beef. But if you go to a red farm market or any store that carries imported foods, then they should carry goat. I'd say you need about one to two pounds of it. Take it out of the package and put it into a bowl. And then put the bowl into the sink. Pour some vinegar over the meat and then wash it in water. When you're done, drain the liquid into the sink. Then get a pan and put one stick of butter into it and leave it there until the butter melts. Now you want the goat meat to be already cut by the store. After you've drained the water out of the meat, put it into the pan. Then get some spices. You'll need hot pickled peppers and celery, stalks of celery, which you should chop up. And you need to add some spring onions. Now, you understand spring onions are different than regular onions. So get the spring onions and chop them up. And once you've chopped everything up, put that in the pan. I'm trying to think if I forgot to add anything. Uh, you need curry. And you want to get Jamaican powdered curry. It looks like Indian curry, but it's really a different kind of curry. It tastes different. It looks greenish, and it's hot. It's very spicy. Use about three spoonfuls. Then get two cups of water. Now you understand you should use a glass measuring cup, not a dry measuring cup. Put the water in the pan. And um, then you should add uh, some seasoning mix. Use your judgment as to how much you think you should add. And when you're done, mix everything up all together. Then turn the temperature up to high. It's going to take about four to six and a half hours because the goat meat is, it takes a long time. It's really very tough. 
and you've got to wait until it becomes tender. It's not like chicken and fish, which are tender meats and can cook in a short period of time. So goat takes longer. That's really why you have to leave it for so long. Next, you're going to make some rice with red kidney beans. Now, you understand that the red color might bleed a little into the rice and turn it red. First, you'll get about two or three cups of kidney beans, depending on how many people you'll be serving. Get a small pot, put it on the stove, and then put the kidney beans into a bowl and wash them. And after you've drained it, you can put them in the pot. You take about two cups of water and add that to the pot. I say that it's going to take about an hour to cook the beans until they're soft, until they're tender. So you're going to leave that in the pot. Next, get some carrots. You're going to want to make carrot juice. I know you've probably never seen that before, but really it's the same idea as tomato juice. Get a blender and then chop up the carrots. When you're done, you can wash them. Or if you want, you can wash them first and then chop them. And when you're done, you don't want to use all the carrots. It depends on the size of the blender. You want to add some water to the carrots as well. So fill it up about halfway with carrots and then halfway, half with water. Then put the lid on the blender and mix it all up. You get a medium-sized bowl and cover it with a, a drain net, a cloth, like cheesecloth, and pour the mixture into it so that the liquid drains into the bowl. Squeeze out the cloth to make sure that you've uh, gotten all the juice out of it. And then after you're done, if you have more carrots left, repeat the process. Put it in the blender, add some water, then pour it back through the cloth again, letting the liquid drain into the bowl. Make sure that you use water to get all the bits and pieces of carrots out of the blender. And after you've gotten all the liquid out of the cloth, you're going to find that you have little bits of carrot left in there. So again, put that back into the blender. And you need a, a cloth that's, that is more of a sheet than cheesecloth because um, most cheesecloth types of can get holes in it when you use it. The carrots will poke holes through the cloth. So you need something with smaller holes in it. Cover the bowl with this cloth and then pour the carrot mixture into it. And as it's draining, take the ends of the cloth and pull them together so that you can wring out all the juice into the bowl. And then you can, if there's a little left in the bottom of that cloth, you don't need it. You can go ahead and throw that away. Then you can leave that and get some Jamaican rum. How much you use, well, you don't want to make yourself tipsy, but you want to make uh, a sort of a punch. So get some sugar and any kind of mix like Kool-Aid, something like that. Mix it all together to taste and then put it in the freezer. It really tastes good when it's cold, nice and fresh. So you leave it there for about an hour and it should be done at the same time the food is done. Then go and check the kidney beans, see if they're soft yet. And after they're soft, you're ready to add rice. When you know how many people you're going to serve, then you can determine how much rice to add. Wash the rice and then add it to the pot with the kidney beans. It's going to take a while to cook, so if you want to occupy yourself with something while you're waiting, it really does take a long time. Uh, you might want to check the goat meat, and when it's tender, and when the rice and beans are done, Oh, I forgot to add, um, you want to make a salad. You wash the vegetables off and 
Well, just to, you just want to make a regular salad. Use any kind of dressing you want. And then you're ready to get a plate, serve the goat food, the goat, curried goat on the plate, serve the rice and bean mixture and the salad, and it's going to be ready to serve. Oh, and you want to get some of the punch from the freezer. I hope it's got a little kick to it, but not too much. Pour that into a glass, and you'll notice that the punch is green, and the food is all different colors. The rice is red, and everything looks really nice. It's going to look very appetizing. Now, my father has a business I want to tell you about, because the reason that I chose to talk about curry goat. It's one of my favorites. Even though in his restaurant, you know, they serve a variety of Jamaican foods. Chicken, fish, all kinds of different recipes. So it was difficult to pick one. But curry goat is really, is really good. If you want to go to his restaurant, it's on Georgia Avenue Northwest. It's at the intersection with uh, Upshur in Washington, D.C. It's near Howard University. That's where my father's restaurant is. It's called, uh, let's see, Jamaican George's. That's the name of the restaurant, Jamaica George. And you can carry food out from that restaurant. See, it's not like a, a really huge restaurant. It's more like, uh, you know, if you've ever been to a Chinese food carryout where you could go and, and bring food home. It's more like that, where it's got the window and maybe some small tables. You know, that each table seats about four people, and, and most of the time people come and get food to go. If the restaurant's successful, then he's going to expand it and move to another building. So I'm looking forward to that. It'll be interesting to see what happens. If you'd like to contact me, you can contact me in the personnel office. That's it.